I'm Andre Brock, and, and I'm Will Atkin. Uh, I'm a part of both of us on the North Shore, so. Uh, I'm a part of both of us on the South Shore. From St. John, St. James, East St. John. Yes. So, a uh, long time ago, long, long, long time ago, people made wine uh, from the basic ingredients they find out surrounding around. Even before there was agriculture, there was wine. Uh, and I, I've heard and suppose that I'm not sure it's entirely accurate, but some anthropologists believe that agriculture was brought out to be able to make more wine and beer and these other fermented beverages that people enjoy. It's hard to imagine a caveman sitting around farming some good berries and not just eating them immediately. You know, I, I think he would just eat them right on the spot. Um, but eventually somebody said, well, uh, let's, let's save these and ferment them. So, uh, Will and I are going to give a, a very from the hip talk about winemaking, just uh, kind of walk y'all through the process. Um, but I want to say winemaking is super easy because, again, going back to those first pre agricultural societies when they were gathering fruit, berries, and all that kind of mess, they made it accidental, right? You know, wine originally came about from somebody had maybe a, a musk ox skin or something like that, and they were out. Gathering fruit into and, and I don't know, forgot him back to the cave or something like that. He came back to the hey, this stuff ain't that bad. So it was done academic. Uh, you can make wine very, very easily. It's a little bit harder to make good wine. <laughs> so, and, and look, there, there's a different level of thinking it. I'm going to tell you, I, I appreciate a good wine. You bring a nice French wine that's 10 years old and you know, tell me to sniff these notes and all that. I can appreciate that kind of thing. But right now in my house, I got two boxes sitting on top of the fridge. So the most big is coming out. <laughs> Critical, right? Um, but this is kind of a special occasion wine because when you make it, and let me ask y'all, show a hand, who's made wine before? Good, good, a hand for y'all, right? So, you know, you're not gonna, uh, you know, we're making this, it's gonna take us a year pretty much to be uh, grateful when it comes to season once a year. And so we're going to end up with, in this three gallon batch, um, a little quick tangent, um, a fifth, like a fifth of wine or a fifth of whatever, is a fifth of a gallon. So three gallons is going to make us how much? Man, we're 15, right? We have 15 miles of wine out of this in a perfect situation. You know, we're going to lose some of the bottom of the rack and the top of the kind of thing. But we're going to get about that much. So this is the kind of thing that you bring to a party and go show off and, and, and bring around and just have the conversation piece I think we're going to do. So, anything intro wise? Yeah, I'll just say this to you guys. I, I've made a batch of wine now. Uh, went through, you know, went to horticulture school. I got two years in horticulture. We, we took fermentation classes as electives, you know, and we made batches of wine in there. Uh, but I still kind of, I was a little scared of the process. I thought it was complicated. I just thought I wasn't ready to do that. And then, like, about a year and a half ago, we ran into a situation where we had a lot of grapes to harvest. And so I told Andre, I was like, Andre, I would love to learn how to do this. I want to kind of work with you because Andre is known as the winemaker. All throughout <laughs> since since college days, Andre always had a bad wine. So, so I just reached out to him and said, "Hey, look, this is a hobby. I would love to learn how to do this so that I can turn around and you know show people what to do." Because uh, my thing with wine is, you know, you guys when you harvest fruit, some you got all this fruit at one time. What do we do with it? You know, like when you have a lot of fruit, you know, one option is you can make wine. And I just think it's just got cool this fact with me. So. But uh, you know, thought it was kind of magical. But going to this depth of Andre, he is in line when he says this is actually really easy. It takes some time. You got to have some patience. But like, I just uh, you know, it was very straightforward. So anybody can do this. Just you got to learn to you got to wait you know wait for results to happen. But it really is easy. Uh, there are a few pieces of equipment that you need to you probably need to look into getting just to make things a little easier. Uh, and that's one of the things that I kind of wanted to do. I wanted y'all to see some of this stuff. Just so that you know, if you had the inclination and want to go out and do it, you know what to look for, uh, and you can uh, you know get what you need to do it right. And, and just to touch on that food preservation a little bit, um, and a little bit about my background, uh, when I was, I guess in my twenties, um, there was an old man in our home camp who used to make blackberry wine, and I thought it was fantastic. Anybody ever read blackberry wine? It is, I, I think, the best, second best homemade wine. I ran into some plums. I'm gonna give a bunch of plums. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna keep that. Blackberry was delicious on that wine. And he showed me how to make it, and it was very low tech. Um, we had, he, he said, instead of buying a tall boy, he had an old Kentwood bottle, 
you know, from the, you know, the, the office or whatever that he acquired from his office. He used to let you keep um, And you just feel that, that air. Um, and, and again, let's, let's do a little bit of science. Um, the, the basic science, the only thing biologically really going on in here is that the yeast are eating up sugar. And so those yeast eat up the sugar. Now, in the presence of oxygen, they will uh, they will produce different uh, different byproducts of, of that uh, that that basically digestive process. Um, but then they're going to run out of oxygen. So whenever you're making your your wine, uh, you end up with wine in in that mix dissolved into the water. Um, but that the oxygen will bubble on out, and when they run out of oxygen, they go into a different kind of catalyst. So like y'all heard of those keto diets, right? Mm -hmm. right. Don't get me started. <laughs> There's some stuff going on with your liver there. But the idea of that is, if I'm eating Skittles all day, uh, then there's constantly sugar going into my blood, right? And then I stop eating, and my body uses up all that sugar, and eventually converts to a different kind of metabolism where it's eating up my fat. And that's where the keto guys are gonna get off on, on how long you let it get your body eat your own fat. It's very in, in, inefficient. And so the same thing goes on the yeast. In the absence of oxygen, they'll start making CO2 and alcohol. Um, and, and that's about the only science really going on in this, or, or very nearly so. Um, so, like I said, uh, Mr. Brady, who taught me how to do this, showed me how to put it in a Kenwood bottle, and he just basically says, seal everything up. Uh, and, and let the, the pressure come out. You do want to make sure let that pressure come out because that CO2 will build pressure. It's like shaking up a cocaine. Right? Except you don't have a lid holding it in. Um, so what, what he showed me to do, and if you don't feel like buying the leaves, you can just take some tubing and get that going out into a bucket of water. So that nothing can come back into it, but due to the air pressure, the CO2 is coming out. Um, so Mr. Mr. Brady and I didn't go through all that science, but he kind of gave me the rest of what we were doing all that. And then in graduate school, I made friends with our food science professor, Dr. Charles Johnson, who was our, our food guy for a long time. And whenever they have a trial on strawberries, uh, pears, peaches, whatever they had going on, he'd say, hey, Brock, why don't you go hit that field over there with no our experiment and do what you want with it. So it really does come down to, and you know, again, more into the history of it, fruit, food preservation. And so I, I, taught a, a, I taught a lab for a class when I was in grad school that was all about food preservation. So we made sauerkraut um, and lots of different, uh, we made yogurt and a bunch of fermented products. And the yogurt, same thing, it was a way to save that milk. The sauerkraut was a way to save that cow. So when you have an excess of something, here you go. So, um, anything else in the mission is the process? I, look, I, I don't think so. Uh, I guess the whole process starts out, we gotta harvest our fruit. So, you know, we've been getting into this muscadine wine. So, you know, muscadines are a, a warm season plant, so they're throwing out leaves, you know, come spring. They eventually flower, set fruit. Those fruit are ripe in about mid or August. Uh, Andre and I, since I did this last year, I'm kind of in tune with it now. About mid August, I started listening to you know, who's got you know, muscadines that are ready to harvest. Uh, we have a, the grapes that we've been using for this project actually come from the hill farm. It's a little piece of land you know, on LSU's campus where all the horticulture students do their testing and do classes, workshops, or whatnot. So uh, they're growing these muscadines in large containers in straight pine. Pine bark mulch is a media. They have them on irrigation. They're trellised. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice commercial setup in containers like that. So uh, we work with Dr. Kiki Fontenot, and once they get everything finished that they're doing, you know, we usually get the call that it's time to harvest. So, like I said, about mid-August to September, <laughs> and we'll go out there uh, and you know just pick fruit. Uh, so, so those of y'all out here coming to listen to us today, do y'all have a fruit source in mind? Do you have somebody? We're gonna give you a bunch of stuff or something. I have most of that. Your okay, most of that is excellent. Um, and, and like we're saying, that, that's what kind of we did. thing, just having access of this uh, from somebody. Um, the other way you can do it is uh, a friend of mine is what I'll describe as a gentleman farmer. You know what I mean? Like I own the land, I'm gonna let you plant whatever on it, and you give me some crops. So uh, he has owned a fruit press. This is my buddy Sid's fruit press. And he's got a wine barber. How do you think Sid has ever actually made one? Every time uh, the, the muscadine season comes around, hey man, you need that fruit press? 
Yes, it has an answer. I actually do. Don't get saved in a box. So you can, if you don't listen to a word we say today, except where to buy, you should, you should loan this stuff out and get free one. It's a little bit of reading. Like a little makeshift co op. <laughs> right, like a little co op. Yeah. So we went, went through some months and on uh, a little over a month ago, and this will be found out on the Y'all let me stand there and pick them up at Lowe's Home Depot for two hours. Right, right. I work fine. And generally, you can look up 101 different, this is more than that, different recipes online. And we're going to talk about some of the science of it and some of the art as well. But it's kind of part, like horror culture, it's where science people are. You know, like botany is what's going on inside that cell, inside the leaf or something like that. Horror culture is, yeah, and why should I care? Full sun or shade, whatever they're going to do. All right. So we talked about the yeast breaking up and all that kind of stuff. And, and then it comes down to um, how am I going to make that happen? How am I going to get those yeasts into an anaerobic situation where they can bubble on out their CO2 and make them some alcohol? Um, it's worth mentioning too that we've got a certain amount of sugar goes into these, and then use up that sugar, as I said, turn into CO2 and alcohol. You're going to max out at some point, usually around 12 to 14 percent, because these yeasts are just they're they're chewing up sugar, chewing it up, chewing it up all day long, and there's a little bit of bubbling going on in here, and you have to come up and, and uh, take a look at this in a little while. Um, but they're they're bubbling on that out, they're going to run out of sugar at some point, point. or they're going to make so much alcohol they can't survive, that they can't live their own waste product uh, for, for so long. So there are different yeasts that will get you different results. Will is turning on to the champagne yeast because supposedly it will take a, a higher alcohol, so you'll get more than 14 in than 12. And if we're doing it, we might as well go for the, the high end. <laughs> Where do you find this? We can order it online. I yeah, I, I, I actually, i got to admit, I use a bunch of Amazon.com stuff. Yeah. But, but they say, you know, wine making is actually a real popular hobby that you'll find wine making stores. So yeah. you can find this stuff locally. Total wine or yeah. whatever. And, and on top of that, Andre, can, can we use bread yeast? I mean, can we make it happen with bread yeast? Mr. Brady, who originally taught me this stuff, he said, look at this slice from yeast from the store, like, like you're baking a uh, banana bread or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And just pour that in there. And again, there are aficionados who have a more sense of talent probably than me, who can tell the difference between the bread yeast and the champagne yeast or whatever. But I made it for a lot of years with, with bread yeast, and I never had any complaints. <laughs> Not after the second. If it didn't like the first laugh, do another one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I'm I'm a, how much bread do you put in bread? Yeah, so we picked. Um, and recipes vary. I've got a three gallon container right here, and a five gallon bucket, as you know, I've got to try to work out. But we fill this thing almost at the top. Um, and and let's, let's go ahead and start demonstrating what we did. And yeah, I'm going to look while I'm here setting up that bucket for the next step there. Yeah, we would always go out and harvest directly into these buckets. You know, we could yeah. kind of, you could divide it up and kind of eyeball where you're at gallon wise. One little trick I did because I was making multiple trips out there. We, working for extension, you're pretty busy and you don't quite have the windows of opportunity. So what I would do is I would be picking, I would fill up one gallon freezer bags and then I could save up a gallon worth of fruit there. I could stick it in the freezer. I could come out the next weekend, you know, and get a couple gallons more. So uh, that really worked well with my schedule. So I didn't have to pick it all at one time. That's, that's well worth mentioning. Don't leave the freezer. You just before, you know, you know, you before, yeah, yeah. I'm just I'm trying to get enough fruit to get started, so I'm just kind of freezing as I get there. And once I get the total amount, then I can I'm ready to work. I just yeah, I just bought the store and freezer lot of stuff. Do you wash it before you freeze it? I, you know what? I do. I, I roughly sort it, but no, I don't wash it. No. Yeah, it's like we try to get twigs and leaf pieces right. out, and if I can get that out of that step, I will. So I try to strain it anyway. At the end, yes. Yeah, but I don't want a lot of foreign debris in there while it's yeah. sitting. Right. And I'll say this too, I don't have a freezer space that he's got. <laughs> but we riveted, we're, we're in a different world. I've got three kids at home, and, and we, it's a different life. Okay, I, 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 I got it, it's a different life. <laughs> uh, I like the idea, in fact, a lot of times I visited a uh, winery in Nova Scotia where they had what they call frost wine, and they would let the, the grapes sit on the vines. Too long until they got a frost. And frost in Canada, I don't know, it's probably the current day, August or something, some great place. But they would let them freeze on the vine and dent it. And their idea was, they claimed was, that the cells 
you know, the, the juice is in every cell in the, the, the brain. And the, the crystals of the, of the um, ice that they form are going to puncture those cells, and you get more juice out of it. Mm. So I don't know if that's true. Well, it may not hurt, I'll tell you that. I, I jumped on to that it? notion, and I think, it, I think it helps a little bit. So, so what I did, what we did, we went out and... What's that? The ice water? They call it ice water. Yeah. And, and you know what? Mom bought ice. I'm gonna buy ice. I made the board to skip the water off the beer, get down the floor beer. It's like that. Um, so anyway, yeah. So we're we're collecting up all the grapes, and then once we once we're ready to go, then we'll you know I'll transfer whatever into what I'll just got to do. Yeah. So we went out and just playing buckets, but really we could have saved a step up when we get in ahead of time. Uh, and it is good either way. And I'll say this, if you're using, uh, I was, again, uh, Mr. Nolan Brady taught me how to do this, and he said a gallon of wine out of a spill, a gallon of berries out of a spill, the bonnet carry spill, I live right on the other side of the bonnet carry. Um, and the, the black berries in the spill, they are two pounds. Yeah, they are the best, the black berries are two berries, right? Yeah. Uh, they'll be best around, and you need a gallon of that, and then fill it up the rest of the way to make five gallons. If you use domestic black berries, you gotta use about three gallons. They're not quite as just concentrated. So again, who are the recipe? But we'll put it into this, and this is a, um, what do they call it, a wine sack or something like that, yeah. that you can order in all the way. You got some house, but. And you can read. There's, there's yeah. so many ways. This has been, I, I ran this through the, the, uh, the right. clothes washer. Yeah. And it's yeah. yeah. called the wine sack. Yeah. 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 And it's a nylon sack. So again, there's so many different ways to do it. Oh, this, is, this is going to catch all the solid material. Just lay it in like this. Just lay it in like this. Oh, it's going to be good. And we talked some about sanitation. I'll tell you, anybody in the beer making, by the way? No? Is it just me? Okay. <laughs> I'm going like, I'm feeling kind of dry right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get some beer and I told the best. Um, that's, that's a difference. Then we got to heat so, it up and cook it. Right, right. So beer has a pretty low alcohol content. You've got to be super careful. When you ever make beer, you got to be super careful about your sanitation. Because any little mold or whatever gets in there is going to scum up your beer and it's ruined. Wine is a higher alcohol content. It's a lot more tolerant. Um, so, you know, we're talking about. Uh, picking and what goes into that and all that, we pick about quite five gallons worth of wine, and I put it in my kitchen on the floor. I got three kids, as I mentioned. Every time they walk past, they lick their fingers with them, dress it all in the floor. Oop, I dropped this one on the floor, let me put that one back in there. They didn't care. After about a week, they started getting nasty, my wife started fussing. That's when you know, when the wife starts busting, that's how you know it's time to do your first strain. <laughs> <laughs> so we just go pretend with you, okay, that we've got these mustard on over here. You just pull this up and kind of neaten up and, and pull that top string, or if you got a, a, a pillowcase, you can, you can manage similarly. And you, you go ahead and put it on in there and fill it up almost all the way to the wall. Almost. Um, we'll, we'll get to why almost in just a second. Almost all the way, and most recipes will call for probably six to nine pounds of sugar. And they make it so easy at the store because they sell them in four pound bags and one pound bags. You really don't have to measure it, you just use uh, what you need. Right on sugar, yeah. Right? Um, and, and add that, so I like to pour my sugar on top. Um, and then scatter my yeast on top. And then get the whole pipe and fill up the bucket so it's almost all of it. Shake it up a little bit, try to dissolve some of that sugar, set it and forget it. Okay? Put your lid on and, and walk away from it for a little while. So the yeast, they know, like Mr. Brady told me, they know where to go. People will tell you you got to stir them in, you have to make sure you have to that. They know where to go with that. Um, and if you have 101 tangents this morning, um, there, there's something called pitching the yeast. So when you, if I had this and no yeast in it, it's just juice and sugar. And I throw that yeast in there, we call that pitching the yeast. But you can also prime the yeast ahead of time. Take that yeast, whether it's the bread yeast in the grocery store or the champagne yeast, like the fancy pants has, uh, whatever you're using, and mix up a little sugar water and, and put that yeast in there and leave it in there for a few hours. 
And it's going to start to bubble up right away. Like it's going to start to foam up big time. And so the yeast kind of has a head start. You can do that up to 24 hours in advance. So um, if you're trying something, muscle down is pretty basic, but uh, mead, no, mead is, mead is honey wine. It's the old North wine, one of the first wines made. And basically, if you add water to honey and look at the yeast, it's going to ferment. The term honeymoon comes from that. It's an old, old North tradition that uh, the father of the bride was, again, he would mix honey and yeast, honey and water. They didn't really know about yeast, but there's a bunch of wild yeast coming in. He'd mix that up, and, and the, the couple would go on that honeymoon for a month, moon, month, 28 days. <laughs> they come back later, and the mead is done, and then they've got the wedding reception. <laughs> mead is a little bit harder to get going, so you might want to pitch the yeast for something like that. Well, if it's your first time doing it, you're a little bit worried about it, you can do that. Um, any, any of y'all gardeners? I'm guessing a lot of y'all are, right? So you plant that seed in the ground, you fertilize it, you water it every day, and you know you did everything right. But the day that that seed, that the, the seed leaf starts coming up off the ground, like, yes, I got it. I know I did it. <laughs> and it's the same thing with this. You put a yeast in there and you're looking like, I got just a bunch of rotten fruit sugar. <laughs> <laughs> and then a couple of days later, it starts falling and then you know you did right. So again, leaving that little bit of headspace in there, the primary fermentation, our first fermentation, I forgot to bring this in this bucket, but you're going to have in there the water, the yeast, uh, the sugar, and the muscadine. And that's what we call a must. What's going to be combined with the must. And you put that lid on that's not entirely air. And he's talking about the five gallon bucket lid, you know, the crimps down right. on the side. You know, yeah. Not a special lid or anything. Yeah, it's just, yeah, it's just the bucket lid. Yeah, it's, it's not quite as air, entirely air. So what happens is this bucket is sitting on the floor, and because I've got all kind of fun sometimes, I can sit in my office on the floor. <laughs> I got a bunch of wine bubbling there. Um, you can smell it. You know, yeah. Start the aromatic. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's the right way to like the oh, We like this, man. It yeah. starts okay. to smell like rotten fruit, and it quickly converts to okay. not quite done wine. You can uh, tell somebody's fermenting it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You can't hide it from the secretaries. <laughs> uh, so that the first fermentation is really vigorous. It's a lot of sugar, very low alcohol. The yeast are in there prime. They're really low in wine, and so it, it froths up. It bubbles up, and that head space is probably going to fill up, which is why we left a little space. It's kind of like some room for air, just getting somewhere to go. Yeah. Y'all, before we get a little too far the water, man, when it comes to these yeast that we're using, just this Red Star brand here, this is probably, probably some of the more popular stuff out there. There's, I think I've seen 12 different, different kinds of yeast that you can use. Uh, I'm just going to say, you'll have to read about each one, because uh, you know you can really get in there and finesse certain flavors or whatnot. So, just mixing up different recipes to get your own special drink that you can use different yeast. So I've kind of forgot what was what, but uh, Andre did talk about it. I did find out about the champagne yeast. They're pretty resistant to alcohol, so they can survive up to about 14% alcohol. So if you're looking to make a wine that's got a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit more kick to it, <laughs> go for the champagne yeast. I grew up in a household where actually nobody really drank a lot of wine. Not, I don't know what to look for in good wine, you know. But, I go to Rouse's, man, there's 175 different bottles. I just run away. <laughs> so, but my mom always drank Cabernet Sauvignon wine, okay? So I'm used to that dryness. So when I went out to get mine, I was looking at all these, I was like, well, what do they use for the Cabernet wines? Because let me go there. And so I went with, I, that's what I went to start out with, so. Yeah. Uh, yes, ma'am. No, well, what is the rule? Yeah, it's one package for each, uh, for each bucket that we get started, yeah. yeah. The, the room temperature that she has. Um, so they, they they talk about serving red wine at room temperature. Every room is different. That was established in French caves where it's like 60 degrees. So yeah. take it with a grain of salt. But um, usually, what I, so let me, a little bit of science is oxygen is your enemy. Okay. I talked about when they have oxygen, they'll keep making. I forget what the particular byproducts are at that point in, in the fermentation, but they make an alcohol and they grow up. Well, they make CO2. Right. So, the, the other, so you want them to start converting alcohol as quickly as possible. If, if you keep working often back into it and they keep fermenting, they're going to suck up all that sugar without ever going into alcohol fermentation. Um, but the other, the other side of that coin is that when you get oxygen into it, you can make vinegar. So vinegar is, they take wine and basically ferment it further, 
but in the presence of oxygen, there, there are acetobacteria, which is a genera of bacteria that live, it, it's like a yeast, they're everywhere in the air, we've got them on our skin, they're, they're everywhere all the time, they're just totally ubiquitous. So if you get oxygen into your wine, in the presence of oxygen, the acetobacteria will chew up the alcohol and turn it into acetic acid, which is venom. So, and that means it tastes funny, that's not good. We don't you want sour wine. <laughs> <laughs> you can really it. So back to this, what we're talking about, that initial fermentation is vigorous enough that it's blowing all that oxygen out. It's just bubbling and bubbling and all that. I like a vigorous initial fermentation because I'm sure that it's blowing off oxygen out of my head space. Because technically, when, when it eventually slows down, oxygen is eventually going to make its way back in. But the colder the temperature, the more slow that's going to happen. So in a perfect world, you start off with a warm fermentation, with your primary fermentation, and the later on cool it off. Um, a lot of people say that the more slowly it ferments, um, the better flavors you get, and the more flavors you buy. Like that. So you can cool it off some, but I wouldn't go beyond room temperature. Don't, don't put it in a cooler, like a walk-in cooler or something like that. Oh, yeah, if yeah. you've got it in the, the 75 or so degree house, that's, that's pretty appropriate. Like, like the temperature in here would be okay. Yeah, 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 this, yeah, this is fine. Yeah. Perfect. So, so the number of fruit flies? I'm sorry? Do you get fruit flies or anything? Oh, yeah. That's my wife. Yeah, I have to get it out of the house. Uh, yeah. <laughs> fruit flies and their offspring right. uh, begin to chew it up, and you get some gross stuff in that wine. Bear in mind, y'all remember that old Lucille Ball episode where she was stomping oh, every yeah. day? Well, people used to match the dog on nasty toes all over that wine. It was still a perfectly fine wine. Every chemical, every nasty, every bug and yeast that ends up in here will either break down into its component parts and become part of our lives. I perfectly fine. And the longer it sits, so there's a balance, right? The longer that the, the grapes sit, or whatever fruit sits in that water and all, the, the more it's going to draw flavors and, and sugar out of it. But the, the longer it sits, the more risk you have to get oxygen in it. And in particular, the seeds, now I've never done this myself, but supposedly if you actually want to crush the seeds, I don't know how you crush the seeds, that's going to great. But if you crush it, or if you leave them, you say on the skin. Okay, the wine is on the skins at this point. And the longer you leave it there, the more you can pull out some nasty flavors from those seeds. I let this stuff sit on for months this time, and my office smells so good. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I broke it open, and I went, that's not right, that's not bad. And I'll tell you, I'll sample a little bit. This is an off hour, okay? <laughs> <laughs> sample a little bit. It tasted pretty good for primary fermentation. So I think you can leave it on there a good month. So yeah, look, y'all see this color? It's kind of got a little rosy color to it, a little pink color to it. Uh, we left all the skins in that primary fermentation too, so that kind of, I, I don't know what it looks like if we were to just to, just to take the juice out and not let the skin, skin sit in there, yeah. but you can gain some color that way. Yeah. I, I, well, when that clears up, that just makes a really nice rosy color. It looks good. Yeah. So. yeah. Yeah, and, and you can see it's cloudy right now. We'll address that shortly. Are you opening up the top? No. Leave, leave it close. Yeah, it's just a temptation. You can. No, no. You don't have that much you know. ever so often. Just so you know when it's kind of done. <laughs> well, this is where the science meets the heart. <laughs> I said leave it alone. When I'm pouring water in the house, I'm still going to look at the lid to see if it's boiling like it's mad. <laughs> All right. Uh, I like to leave it because every time you open that lid, there goes your CO2. Now, if it's still fermenting vigorously, you can open it up and stare at it and poke it. And that's, yeah. what I, that's what I do. Whatever. 
and close it back up when you're good. But especially, and, and they're not good people. But y'all smell it, and I'm kind of look. Okay, I see some foam in there. I got to close. I'll leave closed the whole month. I don't want to look at it. It's just, it's so right. there's an opinion bearing on this, but like I said, just don't don't. When it's almost out a month, don't be checking it every few hours. <laughs> fermentation is slow down by that point, and you already get a little risky. Yes, ma'am. Ratio of water and sugar mm -hmm. to yeah, we right. have, uh, right. So, that, right? well, that's right. So, we had almost five yeah. gallons of mustard on okay. per volume. Okay. But, of course, if I support four water in there, it's going to fill in all those gaps. Mm -hmm. in the okay. So, so I'm going to tell you, I have no idea how much water I put in there. I put enough water until we go ahead and go close to the top. And so, it's going to mostly be mustard on and mostly mustard on juice. Now, in, in industry, they don't add water. They've got big machines that can take a bunch of juice out of that. And that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, what about using the crock pot? You know, the crock pot. Crock. I don't think you're using a crock. Yeah. Because I haven't seen it with water in the bottom. You can't. You can use. So really, I could just leave that in there for several months, and those mustard nines will eventually break down and, and let all the juice out. We've got to use it. Without water, yes. Yeah. But you have a very small amount of wine, usual wine the bottom. And the other problem is that they call that airspace between your muscle on and the meantime. So the top part that's got all that air in is root. It's just the bottom part as it's filled with water that's getting better and better. The sauerkraut is the same way. When you make sauerkraut, you punch it down with a stick and try to knock all the air out, and you lose that top leg. You pull that off and you throw it away. So same kind of idea here. So the, the water. It is not losing it, um, but it is kind of a safety precaution to, to keep all that up, to get a dock and to get a lot of the as well. Okay, so we're half hour in, we're still on step one. <laughs> <laughs> so I pull this out, drip, drip, drip. Always have an extra bucket on hand. Uh, okay, right here. So now I've got a bunch of water back, close to three gallons. In fact, I was really pushing my luck this time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a really good view on that. I beat the heck out of this. Uh, so I've got my bucket full of juice right here. So I'm squeezing this one out, trying to get it out. And I come over here to my wine glass. And y'all can come in and look at this. You're going to break it if you want. Because you understand the basics of it. Yeah. So there's a board right here. And I go ahead and dump see it, man? Yeah. my muscle down in there. And this thing, you know, the ground right um, it comes with a bunch of other boards, so these two plates are going to go right on top to make yeah. kind of a solid plate right there on top. Yeah, I can see how it fits inside this uh, slided barrel. And then because, I mean, I ain't that good, I'm not feeling this tucked up in my heel. Maybe right here when I'm stuck. So you put these blocks in, and, and those sit under the board. Basically like spacers, so that you can screw it all the way down and press it. Press it, press it, press it. And it's got this little screw right here. So I just took a Tupperware container, stuck it under right here, kept pressing this thing. Eventually I got into the real muscle part of this and get some leverage. I'll do it by myself in a work shirt. Oh, good. Oh, good. Please don't break. I'm uh, the, the previous summer, he and I did together a lot easier. Yeah. He had a wine making buddy. Took it all off. So you press the heck out of that stuff. And it doesn't get a whole bunch more. I, I'm not even. Like, Maybe about another bottle of wine out of that. But I tend to think that that squeezing stuff is like the, the concentrated, the best part of it. Yeah. That's got to go back in that area. That's one more bottle to keep the party going. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very, a very, very simple fruit press. I mean, you could get these probably for under $100. Uh, Y'all notice here, we've uh, mounted it on this little uh, this piece of wood here so that we can use it on the tabletop. We can bring it around, stuff like that. We kind of share it amongst some people, so we're always loaning it here and there. So it is really nice. Question right there. So, so. When you pull that bag out, the rest of it is in this bucket. Yeah, we're leaving it all the liquid is behind in the bucket. And He's going to go over there and press the bag to get whatever liquid he can to add oh, back okay. to the bag. Okay. We're trying to get, we're, we want to drop all that liquid. So oh, okay. That's our line. I'm okay. taking that somewhere. I'm going to pour it back into there. Yeah. Uh, now, as y'all can imagine, from all the action of pressing this stuff and transferring and tanning and all that, we end up working some more oxygen back into it. So, the solution is, you throw a little more sugar. I like to use six pounds. Uh, I like to use a like dry wine. In fact, you get a dry wine in my mind. I like it better than all. I gotta say, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, 
Yeah, this one right here. Um, who would have auction this off? Yeah. 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 Oh, he brought, okay, he brought, yeah. he brought a poster. I'm ready to get it. I'm ready to get it. I'm ready to get it. So, you say some back. I did give him a primary fermentation, my first fermentation, I put four pounds of sugar. And then I put another one pound. When I, when I get recipes of berries, but hold some back. Don't give it all you should in the primary fermentation. All that rack and fooling around on it, and I got it back to give the bucket. I poured another pound of sugar and I stirred it up. No more yeast. So that no more yeast. Yeah, no more yeast. yeast. There's that blue colony going on in there, and yeah. they're just supplementing that colony. That, that fermentation has slowed down after a month, but they're still viable with yeast in there. They just run out of sugar. They're just kind of hungry. Right. So when you give them sugar, and if you want, you can pitch more yeast into it, just eat what you're worried about or whatever. But they are active in there. You have a question? Oh, oh no. Okay. So that's five pounds so far. Yes, sir. So y'all just to kind of recap that, remember we had about five gallons of fruit, right. then we added enough water to kind of smother the fruit, right. fill in all those gaps down there to push that air out. We dropped in four pounds of sugar, we did the primary fermentation with that, so I had the yeast as well. Then we separated the juice, and now we have just the juice in the container, right. and that's where Andre's coming in with another one pound right. of sugar. Right. We're, we're giving those yeast some little bit more food so they can continue right. on, and we can do secondary fermentation. Yes, I know this may sound like a dumb question. Is it oh. distilled water or is it just? Well, that's water? a good question because do you want to use tap water? Should we use I distilled water? water? I use it. Should we go by bottle? <laughs> 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 no, it doesn't matter. Oh my goodness. 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 It'll work out. It'll work out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you ought to see what they do in industry. <laughs> the thought that gets squished in your mind is free water. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> so actually, um, there, there are a little bit of nutrients in um, tap water. There's just a little bit of phosphorus or whatever the heck is in there. That, uh, so let's just say it doesn't interfere with, with the yeast production. And, and since we mentioned that too, you can actually take ammonia. There's, there's a food grade ammonia. That ammonia is like fertilizer, it's a nitrogen source. And you can actually put that in here that's supposed to have the yeast to grow it. The yeast nutrients. Yeah. Yeah, kind of forgot about that. It doesn't hurt. When we're doing that fermentation, you can mix in a little bit of this yeast nutrient. So we're shoving, we're shoving their mouths full of sugar to keep them going. However, they don't survive on this sugar, so it's kind of like supplement stuff. But there's a little bit of nitrogen in ammonia. There's some phosphorus in here and other minerals and elements that they, they need to grow. This is when we're mixing in that primary fermentation. So when we first get started, yes. Okay. Yeah, because okay. they'll hold that in solution the rest of the And as far as how much, I never really read a good amount. We just talked about a tablespoon. Yeah, I think it's like a tablespoon. I think it's like a Okay. That's so not necessary, though, but you know. So we pressed it. We've tossed the grapes out. I feed those to my chickens. Are you gonna do that? Yeah, yeah. Oh my god. Um, and I don't know if y'all can see from the back, but there's a little bit of bubbles up right here at the neck. Several days ago, it was really frosted, and I thought it might pop out, but it didn't. This is what they call air line. So, like I talked about, a hose going in the bucket earlier, same idea. But sometimes you see a little F yeah. shape, like the back of the bucket. Yeah. Where there's, yeah, there's always water holding right there, but pressure can push it out. Um, be careful. And y'all didn't see me walk in with it, but I walked in with it in a five gallon bucket, six to five gallon bucket. The plum wine I alluded to earlier was some of the most delicious wine I've ever had. But I put it um, in this secondary fermentation. And in fact, I, I kept a bunch of plum flesh and stuck it in there. Um, and knowing that the, the initial fermentation or the secondary fermentation might be really vigorous, I went ahead and stuck it in my bathtub with the house. Um, so in case it gets so much pressure that this thing pops off, it'll just go into the bathtub. And, and I came home from work and this was laying on the, on the floor on the side of the bathtub, two feet away. And the ceiling had a brand new mosaic. <laughs> The lovely purple that my wife was not super impressed with. Uh, I managed to scrape off the plum 
house and sparkles on the ceiling <laughs> and painted back over it. But whoever bought that house now is living with a purple stain in their bathroom. It's permanent. Oh, no, sorry. It was not so hard. Well, I tried bleach. My wife tried yelling at it. Tried yelling at me. Tried hitting me hard and telling me to struggle. Nothing worked. It stayed. So I like to put it in a pocket. I'm lucky to catch it. Live and learn, right? Y'all are going to learn things along the way. So I'm popping this thing open. I can really smell it right now. Oh my, this is nice. So uh, it's permanent right here, and we're ready for the second step. Is that water in there in the top? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just water. Yeah, yeah, it's just water. Yeah. There's a little field water in there. No, we're pouring that in there, and that's what basically the water says about it. Okay. Remember, y'all, unless those gases escape, they can kind of kind of burp out of the water. However, but you're not oxygen's not coming back in. So you keep on adding water to this. <laughs> Uh, you know, but you just want to make sure water. that it's at the line mark. It's not going to really go down. Because look, we put a top on this too, so it's not evaporating out there. I, I never right. had to refill it. Now, I, I've left it sometime for much of a year where, where that stuff just water. starts to eventually evaporate. You fill in the water. What generally speaking, you just put a few tablespoons of water and you're good. Just what is that about? One quick question. I'd like to get back out to the program. Are you handing out any samples today? <laughs> I'm just asking. Well, we're going to have a quiz at the end. Yeah. If anybody gets nine out of ten questions right, gets a free All right, I'll give you ten questions and answers. I'll leave, but you're hey, probably good. I'm hoping you'll enjoy this lecture. Hey, you know, about buying it says on this next talk here, we're, we're you know, it's fermenting again, these tanks here. You can buy the little handles here. This is a little, oh, this is right. a five gallon cardboard here. I started out with a five gallon, but I only filled it up about halfway, so. Uh, I think this is probably a little bit more appropriate there. But y'all look, you can buy these little handles that fit on here because this gets heavy. You know, moving this around is kind of it's awkward, you know, and it's made out of glass. Yeah, you, if you keep rinsing it off and sometimes using bleach, which is even slipperier, and I've broken a few of these. And I'm just, if good, I had good hand in the first place. I'm and then look, that. I find you can get these nets. Yeah, yeah. This is basically <laughs> a little a bag that you kind of sit in yeah, and right. Just to help you. Yeah. 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 Just to help you move around, you know. My first batch of wine had to go up three flights of stairs. So, I mean, it's, it, 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 that's why I've invested in the, in the holding material. So. And, and the, the size of it, you can see what the yield was with a, a good hard, letting it sit for a long time, letting it really get loose, and pressing it hard. I came up with almost three gallons. You don't want a bunch of air. I mean, we'll fill this up to here, and then all this oxygen up here. The top layer is going to get gross, which means you don't separate it out, but it's going to be a little bit more nasty wine. So what you, what you can do, what I've seen some people do, is fill it, put as much in as you can get out of it, and then fill it with marbles. You start putting a bunch of glass marbles in there so that the level eventually comes up pretty close to right there. Okay, so I clean this out. At, at this phase in the wine, I like to clean myself a little bit better. Uh, we're starting to get more toward food product. And you can do like a 10 to 1 bleach to water solution to, to sterilize stuff. And this is just a, um, a siphon. Oh, that's what I thought the whole well, I'm going to get some of that, would you? I've got uh, the tip of this is a little shut off valve so that if I'm just standing right here, it's not going to come out. But when I touch it to the bottom of the bottle, it'll come out. See, so I can't even fit the whole thing in there. Go ahead and sit against the bottom if you want. Big part? It is pretty good. It's out there. It's crazy, bro. Y'all see how he's priming that side yeah. for two days, just pumping it to get a good flow. And once we get a flow, it should be yeah, There we go. I don't know if y'all can hear that, but I mean, it's coming out. Because the part that's our bottom, right? Not waste. No, yeah. Well, so, okay, yes. so check this out. As, as this is going, um, you can see it slowly coming down. It is still fermenting. But um, we've got a bunch of, you can see how cloudy it is. You'll see, on the bottom. see on the bottom, uh, the bottom. Yeah, that's dead yeast right here. Yeah, it's dead yeast that are dying off. There's probably a little bit of plant cells that are still falling. There's a bunch of grass that we put in here that has now come out. And you don't want that to be wine bottle. You, you ever had homemade wine from somebody and it's all cloudy looking? Yeah. yeah it's, and I've done that. I've really? done that to my company before. Great. Um, <laughs> but you try to come to them. So a lot of stuff is going to fall out. No, it's not strange. We're just pulling out the top now. So you don't have the very bottom of this. You don't have it all again. Not well, yet, but I'm fixing it. Yeah. See, he's old. Y'all see, he's been yeah. I just had it higher up because I, I filled it too much. 
I'm not, I'll tell you right now, I'm not perfect, despite yeah. what my wife tells you. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to leave a bunch of this yeast behind. So gravity so, is our filter. Right. So it, all that stuff fell down to the bottom of gravity, and we're just going to be very careful. How long was it in this bottle? bottle? In this, I normally keep it in here for a month or two. Um, it's been sitting in there a few weeks at this point. So it's really a little premature. We're just, for demonstration purposes, I thought it would be worthwhile. It's not really messing anything up. This yeast is also still in suspension. If I had waited three or four more weeks, most of that stuff would fall out. Um, but I'm doing it now. I'm sucking a bunch of this extra into there. But you can see he's being careful not to get a bunch of extra air in there. And I don't mind it going one more handling. So they call this racking the wine. So that was with primary fermentation here, secondary here, and now we're starting to rack it. So we can assume at this point that it's mostly done fermenting. Mostly done. All right? Uh, serve the wine before it's time, right? You're going to leave this stuff sitting for a long time. And even if there's just a little bit of sugar still in there, and of course you still got a lot of yeast in there, you put a dozen of these on your wine rack with the white carpet. <laughs> So, Mr. Bill used to tell me it's probably done after a month. Give it three months to be sure. I give ah, it several months yeah. because once you've got it in here and you've got the airlock, there's no option coming back in. I mean, you, you know, you can get a wine that's 100 years old and long been on its side. If y'all don't know this, wine storage keep on its side. If you do it like this, the cork can dry out and get air in it. If you keep the cork, well, that's why wine racks. Except the, the bottom of the top. So keep that cork wet and it'll last in the No kidding. I mean, I, there's, there's almost no limit on how long it will last. Um, this is pretty doggone simple. It's like a giant wine bottle that is being kept on. So as long as you've got air in the little air lock, it's going to be good. Uh, we moved uh, from Jackson, Louisiana to Lafayette five oh, years ago. Oh, and I went to my shed and I had a few of these. Sorry, and I just had all around these. Yeah, I got it. Okay. I hadn't gotten around to the bottle yet. And I, I said, well, shoot, all that stuff got to be bad by now. And I, I pulled the lid on one. I had a five gallon bucket with the airlock. I pulled the lid and I dumped it into the pea gravel on the side of the yard. And, oh, wait a minute. Got a little cup. Oh, dang. This is <laughs> I had like 20 gallons of wine that had just been sitting there for years. So, so anyway, you're pulling, every time you rack it, you're pulling some. You're leaving some yeast behind and other particulars. So it'll so clarify your wine, it'll clean your yeah, wine, it'll right. improve your quality of your wine. Yes. And you want to do typically about two or three rackings is usually sufficient. Um, that last bottle of wine that you bottle, that's going to be for, for you and your immediate family. That's not the show off bottle of wine, just drag all the stuff off the bottle. <laughs> but you, you have plenty of giveaway wine uh, in the meantime. Um, Oh, so uh, if you want to clarify it further, oh, two other things. One, every time we do this, we're handling the wine. So we're shaking up a little bit. Yeah, it's not very much, a little bit of oxygen. So there's a balance between, I could rack it 10, 12 times and get it clearer and clearer every time, but at some point, I might start working too much oxygen into it. So there's a balance between clarity and potentially functifying it, to use a scientific term. Um, <laughs> but the other thing, one, one more point about this, there's a product called bentonite clay. Mm -hmm. um, bentonite is a powdered clay that you put it like at this point, you'd be mixing it into this bucket and stirring it up. We're getting down to the flood. Um, and that bentonite will bind and make a, a, a molecular matrix in the iron content now. Molecular matrix is which is just a bunch of, like a net, chemical species, in this wine, and it settles out and draws down a bunch of the other particular matter with it. So if you want to clarify it one step further, maybe rack it once or twice, mm -hmm. then work it in bentonite clay, let it sit for a month, and a good long while. Don't rush this stuff. Um, and, and then you'll have more gravity on the bottom, and the wine will be that much clearer. Yeah, many people wait. The other thing, Mr. Milton also taught me how to cook, and he said, number one lesson in cooking for a big group of people is make it real late. Don't serve them until like 8, 9 o'clock at night when you're far <laughs> oh man, that's a too thick. Look, when you start picking some muscle down in August, people are calling, oh yeah, Herbie, you know, you make some wine. You make some wine, man, one more. What do you want? Easter, May, if you love it. And make it before the July. So, 
We have racked it, our first racking. Y'all stand. Y'all can see all the leftover oh, hands. I mean, that was, that's what was in the bottom of that tank. Wow. Yeah, all right. So if, if I were, I didn't think what this said, that dog ain't a hose pipe anywhere near it. If I were at my house, I'd spill this stuff out, hose it out once or twice, maybe some bleach water, and then we're gonna fill it back up. I'm gonna throw this in the yard. Yes. Will, you gonna fill in any gaps off that stuff? Yeah, 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 you go ahead and do that. Look, I'm talking about bottles, okay? I have a question. So, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, please start to get away from the uh, my guess would be, you know, I don't want to it. Maybe it's cheaper. Maybe they can add it. Will that take a Not that I'm aware of. Monica, do you have anything to say? I don't really know. I mean, you find it on everything these days. I mean, they find it more and more screwed up. Maybe they take it out. It's improved a little bit. You can get some improved water. Yeah, they have parking. Snakes. 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 But look, we're going to need, once we, you know, we're getting to the point here where we have to finish wine and we need to get in a bottle. Uh, you know, you can go out and buy a whole box of computers of brand new bottles. But at the same time, y'all, we got glass bottles. We're going to use them all. We can save them. So as long as it's not in the screw top, uh, you, know, you can save those bottles. You can soak them overnight. You can get those labels off. You know, you can get a, a nice clean glass bottle. I rinsed all mine with a, uh, a bleach solution, you know, went through and cleaned them all out, let them all dry. Uh, you can kind of, you can gauge how many bottles you need. Remember, you got five bottles for every gallon of wine, so we have th about three gallons of wine. I need to have at least 15 bottles ready to go. Probably want to have a couple of extra cleaned out and ready to go just in case, you know. You might have a, an awesome year and you make a little extra there, so just so you have something to put it in, you know. But anyway, once you get them all clean, uh, uh, and the process is basically going to fill it, you guys. And look, it's not even much different from that same process we saw when he transferred it from Rice into a different barrel. So instead of going into another carboy or another bucket uh, with the racking process, we're going to use the same dispenser there. And this is actually the wine bottle filler. Okay? So it's that same mechanism. Uh, you know, we'll have it all ready to go here. We'll prime that siphon. This nice little valve, this tip valve on the end allows it to where, you know, if, I, if it's no pressure on it, it'll hold it there. I can shove this into my bottle, push it all the way down. I, I release that valve when it touches the bottom of that bottle, and then it fills it up. And then, you know, with a little bit of practice, you know, I can pull it out when it gets to the right level, okay? Yeah, it's real simple. It's kind of fun, but let me tell you, y'all, have those bottles ready to go, have them all within arm's length. That way you can just continually do this. Uh, whoops. I tell Andre that uh, we added some options. <laughs> yes, I, well, I kind of a mixture too. Okay. Uh, we pulled them from a, a research plot. She's got like four different varieties growing. Not all of them ripen at the same time. So uh, the grapes that went into this one, we kind of there were some red ones, there were some green ones too. Mm -hmm. uh, the green variety was called Coward, uh, if anybody was kind of interested in that one. So, and the red variety, I just can't think of the name right now, but we had two red varieties, two red. One of them was Carlos, the other one I cannot recall. Yes, ma'am? The, the Muscadines, you find they'll grow as far south as they have, like oh, Marlins. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. You can walk out in natural vegetation and easily find a Muscadine vine. So just, they, they easily grow here naturally. They're probably originally from St. Carl, our South East Louisiana. <laughs> now the ones you go to the you know you go to the nursery and you look for muscadines, they're improving on those native varieties, the native uh, species out there. You know they got bigger fruit, and things like that, higher sugar content. You know, kind of some more conducive to growing for uh, you know fruit consumption. So, but you can totally if you could harvest wild muscadines and do the same thing. It's just it's, those newer those varieties, the fruit varieties out there. And there's a reason why they sell those. They make them more, they yield more, yeah. and all that. So. So they did have a hose outside, <laughs> and Joe got it to work for me, and so we're going to, so I, I rinsed out the last of the little right there at the bottom, for the most part, and here we go again, push right back into it, and I'm going to go, oh, 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 
So you have to see what we're doing with those is mm -hmm. um, transferring so back to the bottle. Right, right. Because I don't want to sit in that room. The fermentation would be considerably slower now. Thank you. Yeah, you see, you did five, six, five, four, five, ten? Two to two, three times. Um, I only did it twice on my batch. Uh, and it's, it's more than anything, man. Not even that long. Every, every two, three weeks, roughly. Yeah. But the longer you let it sit, the more complete that fermentation is going to be, and, and the more the more stuff is going to settle out. So every time you draw out, it's, it's not just the fact of how many times you're racking, but how long you let it sit. Oh, on um, YouTube, Will, is that? Oh, what's that? Doc. They, they did it. So last year we did this stage by stage with somebody with communications, and she filmed the picking. She filmed the firm, primary, primary, whatever. And, and she eventually the piece of that together. It came out. Is something else you could ask on her Facebook page? I know. There, there's some YouTube. I don't know if you can search us on YouTube or if you have to have a link. Yeah, right? uh, she made a web page with you guys, and I don't have that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. But just search for Muscadine Wine LSU and it'll come up. Oh, okay. All over Facebook, man. It's, it was real popular, you know. So. Okay. And we got to, we were in a fancy food kitchen, y'all. That was a nice thing. <laughs> so y'all, what's we're, we're short on time, not surprisingly. Um but that that's the gist of it right there. So at this point, you can if you want hey, hold back a little extra sugar for this point. Um, Y'all can see, I did work a little bit more often into there, whether I meant to or not. Um, not probably enough to be a problem, but I'm going to take just a little couple of teaspoons, tablespoons, maybe, full of sugar, and drop them into there right now. That's just fixing to ride in my truck all the way back to my house and all that kind of mess. Just to be on the safe side, I'm going to put a tiny bit more sugar. You can't afford them doing that too. If you keep putting sugar, 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 it's going to be too sweet. With most homemade wine, people expect them to be kind of sweet anyway. Um, but but kind of just take that with a grain of salt and then use your judgment. Like I said, a lot of this is where art meets science and you kind of got to figure out your own little thing. So there's a million and one recipes online. Uh, just about anything that's got some, anything that's got sugar, you can make into wine. Preferably it's got a little sour to balance it. I used persimmons one time, and persimmons don't have, they're just sweet, there's almost no sour to them at all. And the wine was kind of okay. I ended up, uh, I eventually added some cinnamon to it. It was like a, Pumpkin spice, uh, Starbucks water me kind of. <laughs> it was it was all right. It was all right. But uh, you, you, you might drink your first glass and then go, yeah, what else you got? <laughs> uh, so like pears did real well for me at one time. Not a whole lot of flavor, but a good acid. Grapes are hard to beat. Um, I always try to do peaches. Dr. Johnson always we go to the Iowa and pick peaches. You heard me say the other day. We, Five gallon bucket full of peaches, but it's like an hour back to campus. By the time we got back to campus, I did not have five gallon peaches anymore. I didn't like peaches too much. I can't buy them. <laughs> so I never did succeed with that, but I bet you it was good. Oh, you gotta have this one. Um, Remember that tomato wine, Andre? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, Onion wine, 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 wine. And don't sleep on the, um, the blended wine. Mm -hmm. Like, um, y'all see these in the grocery store, blended wine and raisin. Mm -hmm. We had a couple of them. Oh, yeah, the air conditioner. The heat is going to be on the wine. Looking at wine and grocery glass. Joe, I think it's on. I had some blackberry wine that came out too dry, and some blueberry wine that came out too sweet. And I put them both in a car for like another month or two. 
and they just kind of got together and got to know one another. And they developed just some really fantastic flavors in there. I called it black and blue. It's a black and blue one. And if you drink too much of it, that's how you feel the next day. All right, we're going to pass out some sample. And y'all feel free to pass out some Hey, y'all, look, look, when it comes to finishing out your bottles, look, bought a bag of 100 quarts for nothing, so I, I'll be making, I can, what, you can make one three more cases here. Look, Andre, Andre doesn't get this fancy, but I got to look, and you know, you get on Amazon, you kind of start clicking, and then you go down the rabbit hole, and you buy these fancy little ball wraps, so you get it all corked up, you put this ball wrap on top, you heat it up with your, your uh, I think the hair dryer would get it to work. And that way you can kind of have a little finished look. So, oh, wow. You know, you can add a little fancy to your fruit. Why do you get the car the Well, I, we don't have a little machine there, but basically you, you find the cork up there, and there's a, just a, a machine that pushes it down inside. So, uh, you know, there's various, there's various types of these things. Y'all have actually seen these before. Uh, you know, usually, usually maybe some type of handle up top to on the side, or maybe one big lever. But the the really nice ones actually hold your bottle on the bottom, all right. And then there's screw adjustments because some bottles are different heights, so you can adjust these things. Uh, but basically, you kind of set it in the holder there. You put the cork on top, and then you press it down. And it's real simple mechanics. Uh, and we just we don't have one to show you these days, but it's another piece of equipment that we kind of share with okay. some friends and uh, just kind of so, rotate it to whoever needs it at that time. Right. So. so all we're really not sure, you know, the next few phases where you're gonna rack a couple more times. Eventually working to the bottom. Um, I'll I'll add it to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, so now, <laughs> look, what we're gonna taste is uh, this is the wine that this is my first wine I made. Andre really he said some really nice comments about it. Look, first yeah. time I did, I was really, really hesitant on adding too much sugar because I did not want a sweet wine, y'all. It's used to Cabernet, so I just did not want it super sweet. And uh, somehow I think we kind of somewhat got there. Y'all can tell me what you think. But uh, so, if y'all got a cup, I'll just kind of come around for you a little bit. The only thing I'm going to mention on bottling, Will, Will told y'all there are different size corks. The number eight, I think it is, is pretty standard. Um, but these corkers that you got, you don't want to just take your, the heel of your palm and try to mash the cork into there. <laughs> They've got a little bit of a, a funnel part that tightens the cork in as it goes in. And I had some. When, when I was in grad school, um, I was fortunate enough to work in the fermented food product, uh, 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 processing uh, uh, facility uh, and food fermented products. And my boss had a, um, had one of these where you hold the bottle on the table and, and you've got two wings out here, two handles, and you try to push it in. And it was very difficult to manage. Again, I just wet it. And I was lifting it back in this place and all that. And I almost knocked it. I did not screw it. And one of them, I broke the neck off it. And you push it. I mean, push it like this. And all of a sudden, you find out broken glass. And I came back that far from opening myself. I said, never again. So they've got these ones that, like Will was describing, there's a bottom, you put that bottle in, and it kind of secures it. And you come down with a handle kind of thing. It's about 60 bucks, 70 bucks on Amazon. Like six. Oh, okay. Oh, cool. Okay, there you go. Y'all heard that? He made one like that. He made a frame. Thank you. 